Welcome. Welcome. My name is Emily Chamley Wright, and I'm the president of the Institute for Humane Studies. For nearly 60 years, IHS has been working to advance the ideas of a free and open society, the ideas that will make ours a freer, a more prosperous, and a more humane world. And we focus that work in higher education because the teaching and the learning and the research that happens at colleges and universities are the kinds of ideas that shape the world, right? They influence the world. And at IHS, our vision is that colleges and universities are these kinds of transformational intellectual communities where the ideas of a free society are just regularly bumped into, regularly taught and discussed and challenged and developed. And our vision is that free speech and intellectual diversity and open inquiry flourish. Now this is a bold vision, but I think it's achievable because we have the secret ingredient, and that is a community of scholars who are dedicated to exploring these ideas of a free and open society with passion, with rigor, and with a sense of excitement and optimism. And it is professors who we work with because they're key to everything that happens in higher education. It's faculty who change students' lives, and it's faculty who inspire the ideas that can change the world. And I'm so excited this evening to introduce to you Professor James Otteson. He is one of these professors. Dr. Otteson is the Thomas W. Smith Presidential Chair in Business Ethics and Professor of Economics at Wake Forest University where he also serves as the executive director of the Eudaimonia Institute. Now, I know the question that you're asking in your head. What the hell does eudaimonia mean? <laughs> well, Aristotle thought that that was a good question uh, because this was the term that he used to describe the ultimate goal of human life. A life that is well lived is one in which we flourish. And the Eudaimonia Institute is a community of scholars dedicated to developing a deeper understanding of what constitutes human flourishing. What are the social, political, cultural, and economic rules of the game that support and advance human flourishing? And what are those rules that actually diminish human flourishing? Professor Otteson is a prolific scholar who explores the intersection between economics and philosophy. He is an expert on the works of Adam Smith on moral, the moral foundations of capitalism and the ethical requirements of personhood. And on this one, I, I owe a personal debt of gratitude to Jim for helping me raise my kids. Because his books like Actual Ethics and Adam Smith's Marketplace of Life, these are really, really important contributions to moral philosophy, but they're also like field guides to parents who want to raise decent human beings. So if you want to raise a kid who actually exercises good judgment, who has self-command in the Smithian sense, and has moral integrity, read Jim's book. It's really, really helpful. So on behalf of Lyndon and Kaylin, thank you, Jim. His latest book, Honorable Business, A Framework for Business in a Just and Humane Society, I really like that title, thank you, um, will perhaps do the same for other aspects of our lives. Honorable Business was published earlier this year by Oxford University Press. In it, Jim calls upon his old friends, Aristotle and Adam Smith, to defend and define what it means to conduct business honorably. Spoiler alert, it turns out that it's really hard to be honorable and try to make money without actually creating value. Who knew? Um, and it's also very hard to be honorable if you use force to get people to engage with you rather than voluntarism and persuasion. Again, who knew? Now, this may seem obvious to you, and if it is obvious to you, bless you. It is just one of the many reasons why I really like you people, right, is that you take these things uh, for granted. But let's recognize that, of course, these insights are often forgotten in our national discourse of what it means to live in a just and humane society. Now, you're going to hear a lot more about that from Jim in a moment. But 
In addition to introducing Jim as our speaker this evening, I have the honor and the privilege to announce this evening that he is the recipient of the 2019 Charles G. Koch Outstanding IHS Alum of the Year Award. The Institute for Humane Studies named this award in honor of that extraordinary business leader, Charles Koch, in recognition of his long-standing support for IHS since 1963, right? Before I was born, I keep reminding him of that, um, and, stead and his steadfast advocacy for a free and open society. Charles has never wanted his name on buildings, uh, but he will lend his name to something that is personally meaningful to him. And he lent his name to this award as a reflection of his commitment, his deep commitment to the IHS mission, and to cultivating in intellectual talent and educational opportunities to advance the principles of a free and open society. Now, it is a particular pleasure for me to present this award to Jim, who plays a significant role in the IHS community. He has served as a speaker, a discussion leader, or as a faculty member for more than 50 IHS events over the course of 20 years. You probably hadn't counted them all up, had you? Yeah, it's shocking, isn't it? He is, in the parlance of IHS, a rock star. Now, but there is one more reason why I'm particularly pleased to have Jim named as the Outstanding Alum of the Year. In addition to all of his scholarly and professional accomplishments, Jim is a man of principle and integrity. And by that, I don't just simply mean that he's a decent fellow, which he certainly is. By that, I mean that Jim stands tall in the face of adversity, especially when a matter of principle is at stake. Now, you might be thinking that a mild-mannered philosopher, someone who teaches about human flourishing isn't someone who faces a lot of adversity. Suffice it to say that he has. He has faced the kind of adversity that would lead most people to say, it's not worth it, and pack up shop. Jim didn't. He understands what's at stake. The open exchange of ideas as a core value in higher education. And he understands that it's too important to abandon. I was looking for exactly the right phrase to describe Jim, and it turns out that I needn't have looked any further than Adam Smith himself, who writes in the Theory of Moral Sentiments, the man who feels the full distress of the calamity which has befallen him, who feels the whole baseness of the injustice which has been done to him, but who feels still more strongly what the dignity of his own character requires is alone the real man of virtue, the only real and proper object of love, respect, and admiration. Jim, on behalf of our chairman, Charles Koch, and the, Inst and the Institute for Humane Studies community, I invite you to come up to the podium to accept this award as a sign of our love, our respect, and our admiration for you, a real man of virtue. That was the best introduction I have ever had. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's so nice awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was going to say all that, and my mother-in-law is still disappointed, but um, <laughs> that seems inappropriate uh, in this circumstance. Thank you very much, Emily. That was uh, fantastic. It is an enormous honor for me to be here with you. This evening, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Emily. Thank you to the Institute for Humane Studies, which has supported me and my work and the work of thousands of other students and faculty throughout the years. 20 years and 50 events? I'm hardly old enough for that to be true. I don't think that could possibly be true. Uh, thank you very much, and also thank you to Charles Koch um, for supporting this. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So I'd like to just say a couple of words about this um, idea that I had about my book called Honorable Business. So Emily gave you a bit of a precis on it. Um, but first, let me say something about um, IHS. So 20 years is a long time. I don't, still don't feel like I'm really old enough to have been working on this for 20 years. 
Um, but what has IHS done for me? It's very difficult for me to summarize it, um, especially over so many years and so many different kinds of events. Um, but one of the things it's really done, so my PhD is in philosophy. Um, but you may have noted, um, Emily said that my position is in a business school and a department of economics. Um, so what is a philosopher doing in a business school and a department of economics? It's a fair question. It's a bit of a strange thing. Um, but one explanation for that has to do with the training, with the education that I got from IHS. So throughout all those events that I've been to with IHS as a student and then as a faculty member, um, one of the things that I got to do was to learn about the important works in literature in lots of different disciplines. I got to meet people who were doing interesting work in fields that were totally different from my own, which expanded the scope of my education very considerably in lots of different ways. Um, it also connected me not just with scholars, but also with students, and in particular, students about my age. So when I first started with IHS, students about my age um, who are interested in various ideas sometimes, and this is very important to mention, sometimes ideas that they can't really pursue in their official studies. They have questions they would like to ask, but are not allowed to ask. They have ideas they would like to explore, but they're not allowed to explore. What IHS does is give people an opportunity to explore these ideas and put them in touch with other students who also want to explore them, not necessarily with a particular agenda, but just because they're interested in the life of the mind and they want to pursue the arguments and reason where it goes. That is a valuable and rare commodity, ladies and gentlemen. If you think, as I did, naively going into graduate school, that that's what college and university life would be like, where everybody would sit around and argue about all the ideas there are, Sorry to say that's not what goes on. The arguments that tend to go on, especially at faculty, I mean, Emily will know, faculty meetings are about things like parking space privileges um, and why you got a $50 raise and I got a $40 raise and this was an act of injustice. Um, ideas actually don't get discussed very much, especially when they're controversial. And the controversial ideas are the ones that are most interesting to discuss and that's the opportunity that you don't get so often on college campuses and this is something that IHS has done. But there's one other aspect of what, that I would like to mention of what IHS has done, at least for me, and that is it has reminded me again and again over the course of my own career that what matters not the most as a professor is getting the next article that will enable you to get tenure or that will enable you to get the next promotion. Publishing peer-reviewed articles is important. Doing research is important. But what's even more important than that, I think, is focusing one's research and one's investigations into questions that actually matter. So I tell my students, I tell the IHS graduate students and other people that I meet, think about what are the kinds of questions that you think you might be able to contribute to that might actually improve human life, that somebody 10 years or maybe even 50 years might appreciate. That's very important. That's daunting. It's a little bit intimidating. But if it's, this is something we're going to dedicate our lives to, we really ought to be asking those kinds of questions. And the students and the faculty who come through the IHS programs are some of the best of the best. They have very considerable skills, technical skills. Let's put them to good use. And just getting the next promotion, that's fine. But let's get the next promotion while also figuring out how we can improve human society. And that's something I think I credit IHS for reminding me of over the years, and I'm very happy about that. And one other way, and this is related to the book that I mentioned, what I'd like to talk to you about, it's also pushed me in entirely new directions. I went into um, graduate school in philosophy thinking I was going to write about metaphysics and epistemology. That didn't quite work out. Um, as an undergraduate, I thought I would be a medical doctor. That didn't quite work out. Um, but when I got my PhD, there was no way on earth I would possibly have imagined that I could have a position in a business school talking about business ethics. What on earth did I know about any of those things? Well, um, I've spent some time learning about those things, and the opportunity that IHS has given me to really push my boundaries into other areas um, is part of the reason why I came to write this book. So it just came out, and notice it was published by a real press, so it's not... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. But it's a very different book from almost everything else in business ethics. So let me spend a couple of minutes and just tell you a little bit about the book, which I think will be a sort of indirect way of giving you an idea of what IHS can do for a person who's interested in exploring ideas and seeing where they might lead. So I wrote this book called Honorable Business. So I'm a PhD in philosophy, was interested in 18th century British moral philosophy. That's what I wrote my dissertation on. Now working in a business school, of all things. So I came into the business school 
Um, and one of the things I noticed was that business school students are often very much on the defensive. And even business school faculty are on the defensive. They, in other words, they have to defend themselves for going into the field of business or for studying business. People want to know why you're studying business. And generally, when this question is asked, there are only two possible answers you could give. Either you want to make money or you want to get a job. There cannot possibly be any other reason for studying business. OK. Um, now, is it true that business students want to make money or get a job? Sure. Is that true for every other college student, too? Yes, it is. Still, um, maybe that doesn't seem the most inspiring vision of what I want to dedicate my life to, if it's just one of those two things. Um, so maybe there's something else. And so what I wanted to ask my students and I wanted to ask my colleagues is, is there some other purpose that going into business, learning the technical trainings that you get in business schools that it might serve? Um, and to think about this, I'd like to ask you to consider this comparison. So consider these two professions, medicine and business. They are both professions. Um, each of them has specialties, each of them has subspecialties. In each case, you need to have substantial technical knowledge in order to succeed. In each case, you may well have to study for, and practice for a long time before you actually get good at what you're doing. And in both cases, if you are good at it and are successful, you might make a lot of money. So in all those ways, they're similar. But consider how differently those two professions are viewed by the wider culture. Nobody says to the medical doctor, well, now that you've made your money, you need to give back to society. But they do say that to the business professional, don't they? Now, I'm sure you've all heard that. Have you ever given a little bit of thought to what must lie behind a question like that? You need to give back. Notice people don't say that you need to give. They say you need to give back. Now, when you were a child and your mother said to you, you need to give that back, what does that mean you did? It means you stole something. You took something that didn't belong to you. Now, is that what people think that successful business people must have done? If you were successful in business, does that mean somewhere along the line you must have done something wrong? Well, my suggestion to you is that, yes, that is what people think. They're quite convinced of it. They think if you have succeeded in business, you must have done something wrong. So here's my suggestion. I made this to my business school colleagues, uh, maybe not a bit risky for my job prospects, but what I said to them was, Look, if it's true, so after we've examined all of the aspects of a commercial society, a market society, the practice of business, we looked at the arguments in favor, the arguments against, if after all of that consideration, we come to the conclusion that yes, business is the kind of activity for which you need to atone afterwards, you need to make up for it, you need to give back, then what we should say to the business person is not you need to give back, we should say don't do it. We should prohibit it altogether. I mean, think about other sins. You don't say to a thief, well, it's fine to keep stealing as long as you give some of it to charity. What we say is, stop stealing. Or to the murderer, it's okay to kill people as long as some of them are bad. We say, stop. So if it's true that we really think business is the kind of activity inherently that you need to make up for afterwards, then what we really ought to do is have the courage of our convictions and say, stop doing it. Now, on the converse, if we're going to continue, I mean, we certainly wouldn't want to have schools training people to be better thieves or something. But if we're going to continue to teach business, be business professors, train students in the technical areas of accounting and finance and marketing and so on, then we better be able to give an account of business such that it is valuable in itself. There must be a way of conducting business such that you don't have to make up for it afterwards because it is providing value in the activity itself. In other words, there must be a way of explaining it, of accounting for it, of describing it, such that it is honorable. And I won't um, leave you hang guessing too long. I do think there is a way of describing um, business such that it is honorable. Um, and that's what I set out to do in my book. All right. So my book's question is, why business? And I developed a new course at the Wake Forest University where I teach called Why Business? Um, and the subtitle is, uh, what is the role of business in a just and humane society? Um, turns out that that was a wildly successful course with students. They want to know. They've never heard arguments in favor of a market economy. Never. Not even the business students. They've never heard it. 
they hear the objections, but they've never actually read any Adam Smith. They've never heard of Friedrich Hayek. They've never heard of Ludwig von Mises. My goodness, they've never heard of any of that. Never heard the arguments, but they want to know, especially if they're going to dedicate their lives to it. Now, why should it matter? Why should we be interested in making a case? Well, there is this. Have you seen this graph before? Something very interesting. What you're looking at there is total production in the world of wealth over time. Now, all the way on the far left of the graph here is a million years ago. Early hominins on the planet, so you have some big gaps here in the beginning, and then they start to shrink up. And as you can tell there, things didn't start to tick up until around 1800 or so. And then, holy cow, do we have a hockey stick. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you um, wonder, as you should, what happened? Now, if you think about the entire recorded history of, um, of human existence, say 10,000 years, even if you don't believe we can go back to a million years ago, fair enough, but the last 10 or 12,000 years, has human biology changed? No. Has human psychology changed? No. If you took a child who was born 12,000 years ago and transported that child to New York City today, uh, what would that child on growing up be like? Well, it would be playing Fortnite like everybody else. So there'd be no difference, no biological difference, no psychological difference. Has climate changed over that time? No. Yep. Have you had ice ages? Yes. Have you had dry spells and heat waves? Yes. Big ice ages, little ages? Yes. No change. So something remarkable happened around 1800, and you and I are lucky enough to be living at a time where there is more wealth in the world than there has ever been in human history. This is a remarkable fact that almost nobody seems to be aware of. So students come into college thinking that wealth is a little bit like kudzu. It just grows. There's really nothing you can do. Um, you, no matter what policy you have, the next iPhone will soon be coming out, of course. It's always been that way. But in fact, progress is a relatively recent thing. And really, only in the last 0.1% uh, of humanity's existence have we had anything like what we're experiencing today. This is what Deirdre McCloskey calls the great enrichment. Now, this is, if you like, um, this is really to show you that a, even a philosopher can make a graph. <laughs> Um, so this is per capita. It's telling you the same story. So those two lines, one, the blue line was created by Angus Madison as an economist who died a few years ago, should have won the Nobel Prize, didn't win it, calculated. This is in constant dollars, so 1990 international dollars, divided by the number of people alive at the time from approximately today to 12,000 years ago, um, so to 10,000 BC. The red line comes from Brad DeLong. Brad DeLong is a Berkeley economist who's the one who thinks we can make estimates going back to a million years ago. It's a bit sketchy a million years ago, but back to 10,000 or so, we can have, make pretty good estimates, partly because that's about the time that human beings began to farm. So they began to engage in agriculture. And when you engage in agriculture, you start to parcel things out, and you start to keep records of who owns what, what goes to whom. These records get copied. Some of them re uh, remain. They're preserved, so we can make some estimates again. Now, if you are a social scientist and you see that graph, What's the part of that graph that you want that's most interesting to you? Is it that long, low, red line where nothing changes? No, that's not what's interesting. What's interesting is what happened at the crook. Something changed. Something remarkable changed. And as I said, it's not the climate. It's not our psychology. It's not our biology. That's leaving out a lot of things. What is it? Well, maybe you have your own theory. Let me suggest a theory of my own. So just to put a little bit of an exclamation point, uh, how big has the transformation been? I was going to ask you as a sort of a quiz question if you recognize that quotation. I was going to give you the quotation without the name. Would you have recognized it? Raise your hand if you would have recognized it. Oh, this is an educated audience we have here. Thomas Hobbes, The Life of Man, Solitary Report, Nasty Brutish and Short. Well, before about 1800, he was correct. That is what life was like for almost all human beings. Um, the average for um, the last 12, 10, 12, 100,000 or more years, about $2 per day per person for almost all of human history. Contemporary dollars. Could you live on $2 a day for all your food, clothing, shelter, and the next iPhone? Maybe you could. Wouldn't be easy. You better hope you don't get sick or injured. What is it today? Today, the worldwide average in constant dollars 
$48 per person. In the United States, $164 per person per day. That's the wealth we produce. So what we have there is a 16-fold real increase in wealth worldwide and a 55-fold real increase in the United States. Now, my question, what caused this rather remarkable change, stupendous change, unprecedented change? Something changed, something caused it. What did? Well, again, you might have your suspicions. Here's my answer. And I'll confess, I'm, um, I'm heavily influenced by Deirdre McCloskey. If you don't know who Deirdre McCloskey is, you should. Uh, she's a leading economic historian. Um, but we can get at this answer by thinking about this. Suppose you have something I want. You've got a nice iPhone. I would like to have your iPhone. There are two ways I could get that iPhone from you, aren't there? <laughs> what are the two ways? OK, let the record show that the first thing somebody said was, steal it. <laughs> OK? So that's one way. I could kill you. I could take it from you when you're not looking. I could promise to pay you $10,000 in two weeks, and then for some reason you believe me and give it to me, and I take off to Mexico or something. Yes, so I could take it from you in all of those ways. We might group those under the heading of extraction. So I can extract it from you, but the key aspect of that is that it was involuntary. You didn't want to give it up, or you thought you were giving it up on terms where I was actually lying to you. So that's one way. What's the other way I could get it from you? I could make you an offer that you could freely say yes or no to. That we might call cooperation. So think about those two ways of getting what you want. Extraction, which includes theft, slavery, imperialism, fraud, and cooperation which is voluntary exchange. Now, which of those has been the tried and true method throughout human history for people to get what they want? So you remember that long, low red line? That long, low red line covered the periods of, uh, let's take a couple of examples. When the pharaohs were building the pyramids, you remember the pyramids? Maybe some of you have seen them. It took a lot of capital to build those pyramids, didn't it? Where'd that capital come from? Slavery, imperialism, theft, fraud. Extraction. What about the Roman Empire with the aqueducts and the Colosseum, and it's all so beautiful? How did they get all of that capital? Theft, slavery, imperialism, etc. So you think about the great civilizations of the past and the things they were able to accomplish. How did they get it? By taking it from other people. That's a zero-sum transaction, not a positive-sum transaction. What do we mean by that? If you just take wealth from one place and put it into another, that's not creating new wealth. It's just putting it in one place. So that's just a transfer. Compare that to if you and I make a voluntary exchange. I make you an offer for your iPhone. You give me your iPhone. We agree on the price. I give you the money. You give me the iPhone. Which of us benefited from that? You both did. Now, that might seem obvious to you, but that is a revelation to almost all students and would be, I dare say, to 99% of the populace of the United States and maybe other countries as well. So what you saw in the 18th century approximately was the beginning of a shift to, to say that, transact, that extraction is actually maybe morally wrong. And what's morally preferred is cooperation. Now, I'll ask you, which of those, do you, those two ways do you think is more moral? Extraction or cooperation? Can we answer that all together? Cooperation. Oh, thank you. Which of them leads to greater prosperity? Same one. The same one. OK. Now, if that seems obvious to you, again, I would suggest that is, first of all, historically, has not been obvious at all. For almost all of human history, as soon as one person or group of people got enough power, what would they do? They would go conquer and kill and enslave everybody else and take their stuff. That's all that zero-sum extraction. What began to happen around the, starting in the 17th century, gaining steam in the 18th, and no pun intended, into the uh, 19th, which fueled the Industrial Revolution was this idea that maybe the morally proper way to deal with other people is by asking their permission, making them offers that they may say no to and not forcing them to exchange with you if they don't want to. So what do I say is honorable business? So if you have a look at the book, you'll see this. This is just a precis of it. First, no extractive behavior. Do not ever engage in extractive behavior. Think of the Hippocratic Oath. Do no harm. Is it all right to benefit yourself if you are in business? Yes, but there's only one way to do it, and that is if you simultaneously benefit somebody else at the same time. 
That's cooperative behavior. So the second is cooperative behavior only. Treat all parties with respect for their, what I call, opt-out option. If they say no thank you to you, what do you have to do? What does no mean? No. If someone says, I don't want to work for you, I don't want to pay you that, I don't want to partner with you, you have to respect that. Just as you want someone to respect you when you say no. Sometimes we think that liberty is really about saying yes to things. And there is a sense, of course, in which it's important to say yes. But I would like to suggest that just as important, maybe even in some cases more important, is saying no. No, I will not work for you. No, I will not answer your questions. No, you have no authority over me. Few things are more beautiful expressions of human agency than when somebody says to another person who thinks they're in power or in charge, says no. So we respect everybody's opt-out option. Second part of cooperative behavior only is honor your promises. If you make a promise, you keep it. Don't do a cost-benefit analysis after you make your promise. You do the cost-benefit analysis before you make your promise. But if you make your promise, you keep it. And third, and if you're a business person, and many of you in this room are business people, this will be perhaps second nature to you, you have to commit to providing genuine value to others according to their schedule of value. In other words, using your own time, labor, skills, treasure, your abilities to figure out not only how to benefit yourself, but somebody else. And you have to think about other people too. What is it that keeps CEOs up at night? What do they spend all of their time worrying about? If, are they thinking about themselves? <laughs> if you are thinking about starting a business and the only reason you're going into it is because you want it, you're imagining the next jet you're going to buy for yourself or something, or how can you get more things for yourself, you're going to go out of business in a New York minute. You have to be thinking about everybody else, customers, clients, employees, suppliers, and on and on and on and on and on. So here's my suggestion. What honorable business is, is positive sum. It's making yourself better while at the same time making another person better. It's a win-win. In fact, that's the only stable relationship I would suggest. A win-lose relationship is not stable. Lose-lose is even worse. But if you're winning at the expense of somebody else, that will not last. You will be found out. And even if you aren't found out, you yourself will suffer. So Emily mentioned this term eudaimonia. This is Aristotle's um, word for happiness. You yourself will not lead the kind of life that you will think is worthy of having been led if the way you led it is by benefiting yourself at other people's expense instead of by benefiting other people at the same time. <clears throat> uh, I was going to wait to ask you the answer to this question. Is money all that matters? No. Um, but here's what I would suggest. What wealth does do is enable the other things that do matter to us, in particular, construction of a life of meaning and purpose. If I don't know whether I can eat today, if I don't know whether my children can eat today, then I'm not thinking about, well, where will I send my kids to college, or will we be able to go to Disney World this year? I'm thinking about, can I eat today? What wealth can do is enable us to address our more immediate pressing concerns so that we can then begin to turn our attention to the other things that really go into making a life worth living. So wealth is not equal to happiness, but it might enable it. That's a very important consideration. So relating this to business, honorable business, I think, allows one to serve one's own goals, but only by serving others at the same time. And in that way, we can get, maybe in that way only, we can get better together. So let me conclude. Why business? I told you that was the title of the course that I started at Wake Forest, Why Business? Here's my answer. Because honorable business is mutually voluntary, it treats people with dignity and respect. If Jeff Bezos comes in and says, Addison, I'll give you a billion dollars to humiliate you yourself publicly, um, and we'll live stream it on Amazon, a um, billion dollars is a lot of money, a lot more money than I have, but if I can say no thank you, and he has to respect my no thank you, then our agencies are immediately leveled. We are peers now. All that more money that he has than I do doesn't mean a thing as long as I can say no thank you. That's the way you treat people with dignity and respect. The minute they can say no thank you, then you have to think about them, not only about yourself. Why business? Because honorable business is mutually beneficial. It also leads to increasing prosperity. So did you notice the order in which I gave you those? The first one is it's more moral. 
Only the second one is that it actually generates more wealth. So what's honorable business? It's using your time, your talent, your treasure, all of which are limited, to benefit yourself. It's OK to benefit yourself, as long as you also benefit others at the same time. In that way, what you're doing is promoting both prosperity and morality, but only if you engage in honorable business, not dishonorable business. And I will leave you with this thought. So understood, is it possible that honorable business might actually be a moral calling? My answer to that is yes, it might be. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.